A very good afternoon to all the dignitaries, my colleagues, and to all my dear students. I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all presented here for an expert session on gaining deeper insights on Union Budget 2023-24. I am profusely elated to welcome our guest speaker, Shri Ashish Vakankar, founder of Equipoint Capital Management Private Limited. May I now request our chairman, sir, Shri C. A. Sunil J. Karve, to present a memento to our esteemed guest speaker. Management and advisory services. Sir wrote 
a monthly column on Indian markets for Fuji Sankei Business Eye, a leading financial daily in Japan. After his earlier roles in Deutsche Asset Management as Portfolio Manager and Head Portfolio Management Services, and Kotec Asset Management as VP and Portfolio Manager for Offshore Funds, Ashish Sir worked at SBI Funds Management Private Limited as Head Portfolio Management Services and Senior Fund Manager between December 2005 till October 2015. He successfully set up one of the largest and highly profitable offshore fund management businesses in India. He launched SBI Fund Management's maiden Mauritius based offshore fund and managed several India dedicated offshore funds of which two won RNI awards in Japan for their 10 year performance. His last assignment was with Tata Asset Management as Head Strategy and International Business. He was also Head Portfolio Management Services and Principal Officer. He turned entrepreneur in September 2019 and started Equipoise Capital Management Private Limited, which is a SEBI registered investment advisor offering investment advisory, offshore advisory, as well as research services. Sir has completed Bachelor of Science from University of Mumbai and holds a postgraduate diploma in management studies from Jannalal Bajaj Institute of Management, University of Mumbai. He is honorary treasurer at Vakankar Bharati Sanskriti Anveshan Nyas in Ujjain, founded by renowned archaeologist and Indologist Padma Shri Dr. V. S. Vakankar. Sir, we are greatly honored by your august presence today and we welcome you to Kohinoor. I request the entire audience to put together a big round of applause and welcome sir. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, good afternoon to everyone. <laughs> Feels like I'm teaching something. I wasn't expecting you to say that. Okay, thanks. Man. When Sunilji Karve asked me to speak on uh, union budget, uh, finance budget today, I immediately accepted the offer for a simple reason. I knew there would be something that would be there. I mean, I would personally learn a lot. Last time uh, I was here, that was a time when I was given the opportunity to moderate a panel discussion and I recall sitting next to uh, a great mountaineer, uh, Krishna Patil, I recall her name, Krishna, right? Krishna Patil. And uh, it was quite a humbling experience sitting next to her, uh, learning from all the challenges, her experiences. And she went from Mount Everest to Antarctica, I mean, had, had scaled you know, uh, all these uh, difficult parts. And I said, if I am going to be here today, there will be something again new that I would learn. Uh, while moderating that session and listening to her, not just did I gain personally, but I also got to, uh, you know, some leadership lessons as well. So I would say, you all are fortunate to be a part of this uh, institute. And with such, and I, I have said that last time as well, I really admire uh, the uh, facilities that you have, the infrastructure that this uh, well-equipped campus has. Rather than uh, making a monologue or a speech, I thought it's good that we have a discussion. So 
just would start, like to start off, you know, by asking you a few questions. I mean, yes, I am here to uh, talk on the budget, but uh, I had this thought in my mind. I mean, the budget was presented on first. During the uh, the entire presentation, pre and budget, post budget, there was uh, tremendous analysis. I mean, I recall. I mean, I I, I, I don't. Uh, I'm very happy to be a part of that panel discussion, but. From 7.45 in the morning till 3.30, we were discussing pre-budget and post-budget on the Republic TV. And the beauty was to listen to all these experts, these industry experts, economists come on the uh, you know, show and uh, I mean, you're, you're there in front of the camera, you have no option, you can't just walk out. So you have to be there and you're listening because you might be asked to counter. I gained a lot and, and, and I must say that it is uh, well worth sitting through it. I mean, earlier, uh, Sundiji would recall during our, uh, you know, school and college days, we used to all rush to listen to Mr. Nani Palkiwala at Brabant Stadium. We used to go there, and that was the analysis that we could get. And of course, there was some, uh, uh, you know, analysis in the next day in Times of India, but nothing comparable to what uh, probably Mr. Palkiwala did. And the, the, this was one expedition or one uh, meeting we all look forward to. But my question to uh, all of you over here uh, and uh, you all, tomorrow's leaders, did you uh, discuss the budget internally? And uh, I mean, did you sit through? Uh, if, if no, it's, it's, you haven't done it, I haven't done it. That's okay. I'm just, uh, you know, trying to ask you. I mean, did uh, during the budget or pre-budget, did you get a chance to do it? Oh, fantastic. <coughs> Any, uh, anybody prepared a pre-budget or post-budget analysis report? I mean, I, the reason I'm asking all this, this year I had an opportunity and uh, it just came through from nowhere and I was totally surprised by that. I had an opportunity on 15th of December to present a note and a short presentation to the finance minister on my views on, uh, or, on or a note on the suggestions that I had for the budget. It's just amazing to, you know, be there. I mean, the, the, the finance minister was there one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it didn't have any assistant or anybody. I had an opportunity to go to her office, sit with her. Attentively, she listened. Believe me, tomorrow you all would be the thought leaders, the policy leaders, some of you might even go and uh, you know be a part of the state government, central government. And I am not surprised, I will not be surprised if one of you actually is the one who presents the finance budget of tomorrow. These, according to me, are the building blocks. Why not? I mean, I am just leaving this thought with you before I start uh, uh, with my presentation. Why not Kohinoor Business School start a budget analysis club? And you can you can name it something you know different, and uh, discussing with experts, with your own faculty, amongst yourself, why not influence policy? Why not present? I mean, it's a it's a small beginning in my opinion. Today that you start, believe me, ten years down the road, the government might actually be waiting for a note coming from this school. Everybody has made representations. I mean, at the end of the day. Uh, Nobody has a magic wand or nobody knows everything. It is all on the basis of what gets presented and people from various walks of life going and you know uh, explaining to the government or presenting to the government what are the challenges or what are the things that they need from the budget. Maybe a budget analysis club could be there and in consultation with the faculty, maybe a note could be sent out. You have, you have at, at least a, a year in front of you. We did the analysis just about 15 days in, ad, uh, in advance because it came as a surprise and uh, yes, we would. But on the day of the budget, when the finance minister reads out some of the things, and I, I'm not even remotely saying that you know those were suggestions given by us that were incorporated. I'm sure 100 people would have given those suggestions, but it's an amazing feeling to sit over there, there in front of the TV, you're watching uh, the budget speech, and the finance minister talk about uh, you know some of the proposals, some of the suggestions that uh, uh, you had given. You you will 
honestly believe me you will enjoy at most because at the end of the day you are influencing policy you are influencing the change and you are contributing towards nation building last but definitely not the least it will only help you in your own leadership skills so i thought i'll just uh, before i start with my uh, budget analysis just uh, dwell upon these few points uh, as i said we would have uh, looked at the budget from a quantitative perspective i mean everybody would have uh, you know gone through the newspapers and everything by now i thought let us take a look at the budget more from a qualitative perspective what does it have in store what what is there that 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 was mentioned in the budget but is not uh, something that was deciphered so i am going to talk about the qualitative aspect of the budget because the qualitative part budget may be an exercise for one year but the impact of the budget and the uh, reforms the policy measures taken through the budget have a lasting effect you the the leaders of tomorrow you will have uh, this budget the, the the impact of this budget you will feel over over the over the next few years as well some of the things that that were announced over there hence rather than just looking at the uh, qualitative aspect of a uh, quantitative aspect of it i thought let's take a look at the uh, qualitative side as well okay uh, during my uh, uh, you know short presentation i will cover uh, budget expectations i will talk about key highlights of this budget how the world views india give you a short summary and risks to the view what is expected from a budget i mean at the end of the day everybody looks at uh, budget but what makes it a good budget according to me some of the things that one needs to look at and 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 uh, the expectations that one should have from budget are does it have clarity on what the economy needs and why budget should be balanced it should neither be contractionary nor expansionary budget should crowd in private investment allocated in expenditures must be in sync with indicated economic needs revenue projections and expenditure outlays should be realistic fiscal deficit must be reined in in absolute terms as well as percentage of gdp these in my opinion are some of the key aspects which make a good budget why is budget so important i mean i mean uh, i mean i just said what makes a good budget why why is it so important these are natural questions and in my opinion budget cannot be about taxes and freebies as the prime minister says you know remedies it cannot be about that i mean i remember during uh, my school days uh, and college days when i used to sit in front of the tv and uh, watch the budget and some of the uh, experts uh, you know stalwarts not experts stalwarts of those days used to be presenting the budget and uh, the only thing that i recall from those days that i look at this budget i've been watching budget now again for last probably 20 years uh, from dr singh's time to uh, madam uh, nirmala ji's time and i compare that with the stalwarts i i mean it's a, it's a, it's it's a, it's a no compare comparison i mean all that used to get discussed was biscuits price has gone down uh, cigarettes price has gone up to pests up to a certain grammage have gone down beyond that grammage have gone up this is all and i used to sit with people in 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 my neighborhood in my building and we used to watch and people used to celebrate when they used to say personal income tax up to a certain slab has been brought down that is all that they used to discuss it used to be a laundry list of somebody so a list of you know somebody's grocery shopping list where the prices movement up and down was was discussed nothing else nothing related to policy so that i can recall or you know the aspirations of india where india should be and will be 10 20 30 years from now and what are those building blocks and what really needs to be done to get india over there it was even then a 100 crore population growing uh, rapidly and uh, there were jobs to be created i don't i don't recall anything but but when i look at budgets of today they are sharp and focused only on a few aspects and i'll i'll i will I'll touch upon them the one thing everybody expects or wants from a budget uh, or in general in life is that you know my income should go up and my cost should go down that is what everybody expects 
but little does one appreciate that my income is somebody else's cost and my cost is somebody else's income so how is it possible that you know my income will go up but my co costs will go down that means bigger than neighbor now in such a situation or such uh, difficulty a finance minister is given the most difficult task of you know uh, coming up with a budget balancing a budget in my opinion is one of the most difficult things we just looked at some of the budget expectations we we'll look at you know does this budget really meet all the above expectations what does india need right now india needs right now to reduce poverty and to create jobs and that is possible only through growth for growth you need investments and it or in capital formation without without growth you cannot have jobs and without investments you cannot without capital formation you cannot have growth investments can either be by private sector or by government we've seen it over the last few years because of uh, mainly because of covid that there was some serious amount of demand destruction plus you had supply chain issues which meant that uh, private sector was bit kgy was bit apprehensive and what we saw during this period is again a good thing is that corporate debt has come down significantly making balance sheets of most of the corporates in this country even the health of the banking sector of this country quite in in a, in a good shape but then who will raise uh, who will invest i mean how how does one ensure growth that is only, that was only possible by investment and that's where government had to step in and you know uh do the heavy lifting and i must say this that india kind of deviated i mean i i recall during the global financial crisis of 2009 the lehman crisis as it is uh, famously known that uh, india was still growing at at, at a healthy it's 7 and 1/2 8% the world was facing challenges all the global economies of the world central banks of the world got together and pushed in for uh, you know a consumption led stimulus the result of that was humongous inflation and what you had was destruction of growth this time around again after covid the same developed economies got together and used the same formula india deviated india learned from its lesson india decided to take the more uh long uh, long cut or or the more tough path of investment led growth what we stepped on was investments rather than you know consumption yes we protected the msmes which were the vulnerable uh, part of the industry we uh, ensured some 80 crore people were given free food for almost 2 2 and a half years so the vulnerable or the weaker sections of the industry and the society both were protected but we decided to step on the investment uh, portion of the economy rather than pushing the consumption part never in my life believe me and and a result of that you know today we see india is 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 an outlier india's uh, growth india's uh, economic growth uh, is at 7% and compare that with uh, any of the developed uh, economies look at even china look at anybody else they are struggling to grow in in fact many of them are seeing a massive slowdown some uh, people are debating not if but when will there be recession in uh, say eu zone or us and so forth but but for the first time i am seeing in my last 30 31 years in the industry india's inflation is lower than the developed world india's inflation is lower than us i never thought i mean i couldn't believe it uh, and uh, india's growth at the same time despite all this is almost two times the the world average so the reason for that is the difficult path which which india took as i said budget may be for one year but the impact of the budget is felt over many years and generations ahead does the budget live up to this role is more important let's take a look at uh, some of the key highlights of this budget if you had uh, you know read newspapers or watched uh, business channels then they would have said that experts would have come over there and said uh, 
Fiscal deficit is the most important thing. I mean, is it, uh, we, need, you have, we need growth, we need jobs, but fiscal deficit has to come down. Something has to be done about that. So if you look at it, we can see the budget has clearly laid out a clear path for fiscal consolidation. That is, bringing down fiscal deficit, revenue expenditure, and uh, borrowings as well. Total expenditure growth. I mean, government has not has reined in expenditure, YOI growth in spending, and as a percentage of GDP is on a decline, which also means fiscal deficit is on a glide path. So it's not just important to have a knee-jerk reaction where the fiscal deficit goes down in one year, but there is a stated target of achieving 4.5 percent fiscal deficit by FY26, and are we moving in that direction? Is it just a uh, statement? Or is it a, a, a wish list or are we moving in terms uh, of, of, of the stated part? And we can clearly see that the spending has come down. Spending has two parts, revenue expenditure and capital expenditure. So spending has come down and let's see what part of the spending has come down. So the, the glide path I spoke about. While total expenditure, now look at, look at the chart over here you'll see that you know revenue expenditure has been on a systematic decline whereas capital expenditure is on the on, on the move up so while total expenditure growth shows a declining trend which is good and shows focus of any government but the quality of expenditure the expenditure is not the issue the quality of expenditure is what matters more and the quality of expenditure is something that has been go that has moved up just take a look at per share of uh, uh, capital ex uh, expenditure as a percentage of total expenditure, it is now at 22%. It has it, it's moved up from uh, FY14 at 12% to the current 22%. And uh, take a look at uh, you know the YOY growth uh, in in capital expenditure. Capital expenditure is uh, is uh, expected to grow by 37% this year. Why is capital expenditure so important? Capital expenditure results in capital formation growth jobs, consumption, as a result, higher tax collection, prosperity, and takes the economy on a sustainable, long-term, non-inflationary growth path. Non-inflationary is important. India is an economy which is not uh, demand constraint. India is an economy which is supply constraint. What is supply constraint? Getting here uh, to... Uh, uh, any place that you want to go to, any whether you are going to office, whether you are going anywhere, you will see a traffic jam, right? Which clearly means infrastructure is, is, is at a uh, deficit compared to what I only urge you to take a look at uh, Indian hotels results. I think in the history of that, com of that company, this year, they have, uh, this quarter, they have shown the highest revenues and highest profits. Just as you had opening of the economy, people flocked. So there is sub, there is huge amount of demand in this economy, fund in this economy, but what we lack is is supply, and capex or capital expenditure basically leads to capital formation, which is important. And when you have adequate capacity, that capacity is non-inflationary. Otherwise, simple, no rocket science. You all know it. If there there are only two goods available, ten uh, uh, people who aspire for it the price will go up, which will have only nominal growth go up, but will destroy consumption, right? Growth goes up. I mean, we have, we have seen this happen in 2009-2010 uh, when we gave a stimulus, people had a lot of money, government employees' salaries went up, there were no adequate goods available at that time, inflation, economic story, India growth story crashed. So. CapEx as a percentage of uh, total expenditure has been uh, rising despite COVID and, and as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's, it's expected to rise further to a 19-year-old, a 19-year high of 22% and has grown sharply by 37.4% in, in, in uh, FY24 as budgeted. Again, as, as I said, quality of expenditure, that is CapEx, matters the most. Within capex incurred, government or central government, particularly central government, when I, when I talk of government over here, I'm talking of central government over here, is doing the is doing the bulk of heavy lifting rather than leaving it to PSUs. In the past, I mean, you look at this chart over here, the uh, cap expenditure, the capital expenditure has been uh, had been high, but 
bulk of it was left even to PSUs to do, public sector and enterprises to do. I, I firmly believe that that you know the uh, uh, government has a better understanding of the broad picture, and it's it's best left to them. And let us circle back to you know the uh, budget expectations point which I had mentioned. Does the budget or the government have you know understand what the economy needs and why? The budget has to cover this point. What does the economy need and why? And who is better to do the expenditure than the uh, central government itself? We have we see over the last few years the uh, government's capital expenditure as a percentage of GDP has been uh, on the rise. As I mentioned, at the end of the day, the government has the pulse of the economy. Just take a look at uh, national infrastructure pipeline. National infrastructure pipeline and national monetization uh, pipeline is a, is a, is a wonderful uh, exercise that the government has uh, embarked on. And, and, and I strongly urge, I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of you would have, but for those who haven't, uh, it's, it's absolutely elaborate. There's a, there's a presentation also over there, and you will get an idea how the infrastructure or the investment part of it and the monetization part of it is all aligned so that capital raising doesn't become an issue. And over there, the state and the central governments account for nearly 75 to 80 percent of the infra spend. Since we are on uh, uh, looking at budget qualitative, and I keep on re repeating the word, uh, you know, quality. Quality of expenditure matters most again. Again, capex as a percentage of GDP is now double of what it used to be in 2019. If you take a look at it, as a percentage of GDP now it is 3.3 .3 in 20, you know, 19 it used to be about just half of that. To give you a number in perspective, cumulative capex today that the government has announced of 10 lakh crores is almost equal to the cumulative capex incurred by the government or, uh, from 1971 to 2005. You are just absolutely fortunate to be living in an India where infrastructure, where capital expenditure and these things have taken precedence over everything else. Growth, jobs, jobs, growth. That's the only thing that you know this government and uh, the government of the day ha talks about. So I, 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 that's, the, that's the reason I gave you the number. This is not only a departure from the past but also Something that you know we we moved away uh, from the developed economies. I, I just mentioned that. I mean, po post COVID, everybody uh, went into consumption mode. We went into inf uh, into investment mode, and, and the result of that is what you see today. And the reason I keep on reiterating and you know mentioning this is again look at uh, uh, external debt as a percentage of GDP. External debt as a percentage of GDP has come down from. 24% to 19%. And within that, nearly one third of the external debt that this country has today is in, in rupee terms. So, we've, the external debt adjusted to that is, is even down further. Just take a look at these uh, charts. So, tax to GDP has improved. Uh, I, I spoke about GST collection. GST collection has been uh, going up at the rate, I mean, one lakh fifty thousand kind of has become the norm now. Combined debt, I spoke of. I also spoke of uh, India's uh, external debt to GDP uh, coming down. It's a secular downward trend. Forex reserves, despite uh, you know U.S. Uh, Fed rate hikes, despite foreign funds. Uh, been on a sell mode because of various reasons, because of various challenges in their own uh, domestic uh, countries. Uh, they've almost pulled out 32, 35 uh, billion dollars out of this country over the last 12 to 18 months. Despite that, we've seen uh, this, this pressure also on the FDI side or the, or, or the funding that was coming for uh, startups. Despite that, our forex reserves over the last two years to three years have seen a secular movement upwards. Digital payments, we've seen huge amount of uh, you know upward movement. I mean, uh, India Stack and uh, UPI, uh, G20, we are going to showcase it to the world now. <coughs> Digital payment, retail payment have crossed 14 lakh uh, crores. 
productive uh, productivity linked incentive PLI program is almost two lakh fifty thousand crores that the government has announced. So, all in all, I would say huge amount of effort taken by the government. At least one thing is for sure: taking a look at the announcements in the budget, which are growth oriented, which are very conservative in terms of their own estimates, which are mindful of the fact that expenditure growth cannot be the way of uh, growing the economy and within that focus on capital expenditure pli some of the uh, reforms that were taken in the in the past so put together i would say government has not left any reason for people to complain that they were lacking in terms of uh, pushing growth or doing what was right for the economy this is a a budget uh, snapshot. I just would like to uh, touch upon some of the things that you know caused the uh, deficit to be high this year. One, two of them were related to the Ukraine crisis. So, due to the Ukraine crisis, what you had was the fertilizer subsidy go up significantly, fertilizer price costs going up. You had fuel prices going up, and the economy was still not out of the woods. So, food subsidy also was. Maintain. So these factors caused uh, the uh, fiscal deficit to be 6.4 percent. Otherwise, I think uh, they would have. It would have been much lower. I will not be surprised if it is lower again when the uh, revised estimates come out in uh, uh, May. But some of the things that the government has taken initiative, and I think one needs to take a look at. 2,25,000 crores, if I'm not mistaken, is the fertilizer subsidy for FY23. It goes down as because fertilizer prices have started coming down now, it moves to 1,75,000 crores in FY24. But I urge you to take a look at something called as nano urea. The reason, I mean, you, you would wonder why are we talking about something so nano called nano urea. The reason is gives you an idea about the intention or the thought process of a government. Budget, as I said, cannot be an exercise which is just about taxes and freebies. It cannot be about only the numbers, but it has to also uh, you know, cover some of the things that are beyond what was uh, obvious or beyond the numbers. If nano urea is successful, we actually are glaring at the possibility of completely doing away with the fertilizer subsidy which is close to about 2 lakh crores right now. India imports close to about 35 million tons of urea. That's the consumption. We import 26 million tons. 9 million tons gets uh, produced over here. But these are some of the initiatives. So the point I want to make is not just the budget, but around the budget, there are so many other things that are happening, including your UPI, your PLI, some of the smaller things like nano urea, so on and so forth, which will result in a huge amount of growth and make India an outlier even in the days ahead. Let me, let me quickly touch upon how the world views India. India is the only large economy expected to grow more than 6% versus an anemic global growth of 3%. This is uh, the, as per OECD estimates. Let us look, take a look at you know, uh, what the world has to say about India's growth during Amrit Kal, that is over the next 25 years. India still remains the uh, fastest growing large economy that too on a current base of nearly 3.45, 3.5 trillion dollars and expected to touch 26 trillion dollars by 2047 with per capita income from current levels of around uh, 3,000 uh, dollars to 15,000 dollars, clearly stating that we will be a developed economy. India's share in the uh, world GDP growth is also expected to rise from 9% to 16%. Two questions that come to my mind over here. Does the government through budget comprehend the role it has to play in reaching these heights? That is what one needs to take a look at when one reads the budget. Secondly, uh, you know, and, I, and if, I, if, I can, if I can squeeze uh, one question thereafter, these are estimates and you will find them in some of the reports by, either by McKinsey, by EY, 
but where do these experts uh, manage to get and extrapolate these numbers and come up with these estimates? What are they looking at? The, at the end of the day, these are future projections. They are looking at some of the qualitative aspects that are taking place and using them to see if it continues as a trend, where will India be? Last but definitely not the least, are you all looking at these numbers ready to capitalize on the huge opportunity coming your way? Is, is, a, is a question I feel one needs to ask today. $26 trillion economy, we are, we are a 3.4, I mean I have uh, lived through an economy where when we, I came into the industry, I think we were 300 or 400 billion dollars and we used to say one day we will become one trillion dollar economy. Uh, like you know, today Uttar Pradesh and uh, Maharashtra and some of the other states talk of one trillion economy. We used to say that India will become. World expects us to be 26 trillion dollar economy. That means huge opportunities for each one of you. Let me just give you some uh, uh, you know perspective over here. Uh, people get worried about you know AI and say you know we are going to be in a job market. And this is a question I have faced, so I'm just preempting it uh, and just answering. Uh, artificial intelligence and we have going to, we probably will end up facing huge challenges as we get into the job market. One aspect, uh, you know, one should remember is that AI is already there as far as your digital uh, products that you use. I mean, you start using something, you start messaging someone on WhatsApp, it starts giving you some options and so on and so forth. That's AI. AI in manufacturing, will it be there? What does AI basically need? AI needs scale, volumes. It, it is basically mass scale is, is the one, because AI, or uh, let's take a look at, you know, of, uh, a manufacturing plant of, 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 a, of a car company. You'll see, you know, massive robots over there. Today, can a robot be used, which has been asked to, you know, fix tires, can he be asked to, you know, start painting tomorrow? No, you can't. They have a specific task that has been given to them and they focus on that. AI needs huge amount of expenditure and AI is only possible when there is massive scale, massive consumption. And the world's largest consumer, that's United States of America, is on a structural decline in terms of the people in working age group. So what you had was post uh, World War II, you had a huge surge that's called the generation called the baby boomers. What you have today is something called as the zoomers. They are the smallest generation. Baby boomers were the ones who were educated, they were in employment, they paid taxes, they were the largest consumers. They are all retiring. Retiring at what rate? Retiring at the rate of almost 100,000. It's like almost like a th thousand uh, people retiring per day and, and, and the uh, expectation of that rate accelerate, uh, accelerating is up to uh, 2034 when you will have close to about 400,000 people retiring per year. In fact, US will need a lot of humans. US will need a lot of people who will come and take those jobs. So, AI on the manufacturing side uh, will only possible if there is a huge demand and the world's largest consumer is having his own challenges. So, put that part aside. But $26 trillion is where your country is going to be. Are you ready for that? Is a question I you know, leave with you. Summary, just sum it up and then, you know, maybe we'll uh, open for uh, some Q&A and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and if I am able to answer, I will answer instantly. If I'm not, all the more reason for me to be happy, I'll learn, but for sure I will email those answers uh, uh, to Madam over here and maybe she can uh, circulate them. So, uh, to sum it up, much awaited personal income tax reformed. CAPEX up from 3.3% of GDP from less than two, three years ago. Fiscal consolidation continues with fiscal deficit down to 5.9% from 6.4. Tariff inversion corrected. So there were certain cases wherein uh, the input items that were imported for export purposes were uh, you know, charged severe import duty, making the exports uh, unviable. So this was something that the industry wanted. That's got corrected. Budget lays emphasis on uh, job creation. For example, if you saw uh, 
in the opening remarks and, and, and continuous emphasis was uh, laid by the uh, finance minister on tourism. Uh, one aspect which I really found interesting was 157 new nursing homes, uh, nursing colleges uh, and technical education. Now just look at it. I mean, why 157 new nursing colleges? The world is getting old. And a person who is old is in only two places, in a hospital or a hotel. <coughs> two things he needs, hospitality or hospital. It is, it is an effort by the government, in my opinion, to not just get ready or to just create jobs for Indians within India, but for Indians outside India. What do we have the most over here? We have 1.4 billion, 140 crore people, 140 crore of us. Why just here? We, I mean, we could go out and you know uh, bridge this gap. If you know, if you, I, I just like to draw your attention. If you notice, in the initial days, uh, the government used to say. A minimum uh, government, maximum governance. If you look at the budget over here, in the, in, the, in the last budget, of course, it was announced, the new tax regime. And the new tax regime, whatever glitches were there, were, were rectified in this, in this budget. What does the new tax regime basically do? It does away with all the exemptions. I mean, we've done away with exemptions even in the, uh, in, on the corporate side. We brought down the corporate tax from 35% uh, to 25%, minus all exemptions. The same thing is happening over here. New tax regime is, a, is an effort by the government to live minimum government, maximum governance. It is about empowering the people of this country. Let them decide where they have to invest. The government is basically unshackling or freeing the people of this country from unnecessary. I mean, I, I recall during uh, my days, I'd say 10, 20 years back, we used to all submit medical bills. We used to submit all sorts of nonsensical things over there. Then people used to submit, uh, ta uh, uh, used to travel uh, to their um, you know, uh, ancestral place or native place, sorry. And what would they do? Come back and put those uh, you know, cardboard tickets and staple them. Oh, 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 utter nonsense. We had done away with all that. I found one thing quite surprising uh, as a response to the new tax regime where people said, Oh, they've done away with so many of our, uh, you know, exemptions and uh, now we are having this tax. Guys, it's moved up to 7 lakh rupees where you don't end up paying any tax. Plus, where should I invest? What should I buy? What should I not invest in? Is, it, is something that let me decide? Investing in some tax-saving bonds. At the end of the day, what was left in my hand was some nonsensical investment which I probably did not even want. Government over, believe me, I, and this is my, my personal analysis, over the years, new tax regime will be the norm. There will be no old tax regime left. Minimum government, maxim, uh, minimum government, maximum governance doing away with these characters called chartered accountants. And with these... <coughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I was basically talking about... <laughs> the, the people who were, uh, you know, occupied in uh, helping people manage the ecosystem. And of course, last but definitely not the least, I, now since I allowed myself to say that, I will call the system. It's a, it's, it, so you know, all know what I mean by the system. It's a check on the system. It's one of the ways the government is empowering people and freeing up people. New tax regime, in my opinion, is one of the fantastic things. Of course, we had glitches even when uh, GST was announced. People said, oh, bad implementation. Just take a look at where we are today. 150,000 crores per annum is the run rate. Amazing. Government has huge amount of money to spend on uh, growth in creating jobs and creating infrastructure. One day, Bharat, metro everywhere. I mean, just take a look at how things are changing. And where, does, where is it coming from? It's all coming from basically making the system more efficient and taking things out of the hands of the system. Uh, I spoke about this. Uh, budget, a, a well-balanced approach at uh, raising investment to fuel growth, which in turn uh, create jobs. Risks, in my opinion, will always be there. They are in more external than, and than internal. 
geopolitical events, Ukraine, Pakistan, China, whatever, pandemic, some oil shock, inflation coming in, uh, some black swan event that uh, we can't think of. All these challenges are there, but I feel bulk of the challenges are external uh, or uh, have, uh, have uh, their presence outside of India than uh, currently that we see inside. With this, uh, I would uh, conclude and uh, thank you for your patience. And after this, if you have any... First of all, uh, thank you so much for explaining it so very well. Uh, I had one question related to the disinvestment uh, target, divestment target that the government has projected. So, uh, do you think that the FI24 divestment target is achievable? Because if you see in the past, um, 8 out of 10 occasions we have missed the target. So, uh, do you think that it is manageable? Also, how important are these? in terms of managing the entire fiscal deficit? See, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, divestment targets have not been reached, we all know. Will that get achieved this year? Difficult for me to say because it all depends upon how the markets behave and how the external environment is. As I said, bulk of the challenges. So who is selling in this market? I mean, at the end of the day, 13,580 something 86 or whatever, is the monthly SIP uh, money that is coming inside mutual funds every month. What you are seeing is the foreign fund uh, outflow. Making the markets lie where they are, they haven't really moved anywhere. So in such a situation, to go ahead with divestment and to push it is not easy. Divestment needs right environment also. And at, uh, there is a demand from, from the industry in terms of the... <coughs> capital gains tax that uh, the foreign funds have to pay. So some of these aspects uh, need to be addressed, but despite the divestment targets not being met, we have seen that the government has maintained a glide path. It is sticking to its uh, you know, objective of achieving 4.5% fiscal deficit by FY26. Fiscal deficit, the absolute number and relative to GDP is something more important. So for that, the other way to look at it is to see how, how the government is managing to push growth itself. So if you look at it, expenditure as a, as a percentage of GDP is coming down. Defense expenditure as a percentage of GDP is going down, but in absolute number it is going up. So minus divestments also, all these aspects are being met and you have an economy which is still expected to grow at 6.57%. Divestment is important because it fits well with minimum government, maximum governance. 
government has no business to be in business is also something that the government has always said. So if you go by that, you need to get, I mean, why, why would you run a hotel? Why would you run an airline? Why would you run, you know, at the end of the day, it's difficult to put, put up infra projects. It is, why would you run a refinery? Why would you run a shipping company? It was in those old days that you did it. Now you need to get out. So there will be, uh, you know, these challenges. But I think I, what I find really remarkable is that despite the challenges being thrown at this government, I mean, I mean believe me, the initiatives or the measures taken by the government during uh, COVID, the focus on bringing down uh, external debt, bringing down expenditure, putting, uh, taking the capital expenditure part or investment-led growth part, minus Ukraine, we probably would have seen 9% growth this year, last year. But you have, and when I'm talking real, you would have seen that. Probably more, I don't know. But you had this challenge. Challenges will keep happening. Challenges will keep coming. But how uh, are you able to navigate through that is more important. And I think they have managed to do it really well. That's probably what gets communicated through this, through this budget, the previous year's budget. <coughs> Hence, I know I said, look at it qualitatively. This year you will miss the target. So quantitative part is gone, right? But still, does it really affect? It still, we are pushing growth, right? And what's happening? I mean, none of the global experts or ratings or index agencies find India coming down, India's growth coming down. School. I have a question that uh, will investments in infrastructure will only be the only be the way to progress of the country, or we should find more sectors to in investment because I think more of infrastructure we are talking about <coughs> in terms of capex. So as we all know, if we have infrastructure, the thing will be pulled down, like the cost will be pulled down. But do we have to focus on more other sectors? So, take a look at this. And, uh, you know, during my uh, talk, I spoke about uh, this National Infrastructure Pipeline uh, site. Just visit that site. Infra, uh, the capital expenditure that you see covers wide, you know, uh, range of sectors. Um, be it railways, be it, uh, you know, ports, be it airport, bulk of it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a laundry list over there. I agree with you. There are two things that are required over here for growth. One is infrastructure. And second, you need to invest in job-creating businesses, job-creating sectors. That is more important. But if I one start, the, the <coughs> idea is, the concept is of crowding in. So I lay the foundation, so when I say I, if the government lays the foundation for the infrastructure, the, uh, you know, brass tax, and that inspires people to put up their factories or put up their units over there rather than government getting into it directly. So infrastructure at the end of the day, power is needed. Good roads are needed. I mean, I had an opportunity and uh, Sunil ji has the copy of the report on, in his office. He has purchased it. Uh, I wrote a report on Uttar Pradesh called the New India's Growth Engine. You would have seen all these holdings everywhere in Global Investor Summit, uh, which got con which concluded just yesterday. The New India's Growth Engine. The New India's Growth Engine tagline that they have used for the summit is my report's title, which I wrote in 2021. I had an opportunity to you know travel across the state to really understand while I was writing there. It's a 550-page report. And I traveled from the eastern border to the western border, across the states by road, uh, uh, the districts by road. I found something really remarkable over there. Uh, first, the quality of roads is far superior than what I see in Madhya Pradesh. The quality of roads in Madhya Pradesh is far superior to what I see in Maharashtra. So I had to first give you a perspective. 
uh, I had an opportunity to go and see uh, the upcoming, probably, which is probably going to be the world's second largest and if all the plans and rollout happens, then it's probably one of the largest airport called Jevar in Noida, which has been built uh, by uh, Zurich International Airport. I, the same place, the same district called Jevar has the airport, it has the textiles park, it has a food park, it has uh, uh, international film city coming in, or spread over 5,000 hectares, uh, 5,000 acres of land, and it has a Bollywood or film-based, uh, you know, theme park, which is on the scale of a Disneyland, Hong Kong. So you fly in and you have nothing to do, three hours at your disposal, take a transit visa, go and see the theme park. Now, all this is work in progress. The, I was there in November 21, and Prime Minister was still to come and do the Bhumi Puja. But the roads, the street lights, the uh, plants leading to the uh, to those uh, projects were all planted. I was like, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I just see on either side fields, farmers over there. And I said, these farmers are basically vacating because the land has been sold. Just see the visionary leadership of that state. The infrastructure, the airport, the textile park is all yet to come, but the roads leading to that, street <coughs> plans leading to that are already ready. That's the idea. I will not be surprised if the state leapfrogs and has growth which is higher, absolute and uh, uh, YOY than the state we are in. I don't want to say that. <laughs> it's a YouTube thing, I could be sitting anywhere. But the importance is that. So idea is put the infrastructure in place and let the uh, businesses come and set up the units over there. But what we need more going forward, and probably it will be a step two, is more job-oriented investments. So you need to have some incentives and some uh, you know help that would be steps needed in terms of you know some of the sectors. For example, textiles. Toys. So these are these are areas which are uh, which create huge amount of jobs. Probably we missed out. We'll wait because I, I, I'll tell you it's a long answer. That's why I, 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 I I'm not getting on on that side. But it basically needs labor reforms. Now those labor reforms have been done. The unfortunate part is textiles as a sector. Bulk see bulk of the labor laws in this country were written in 1890 and also in 1940s. They, are, they were still valid over here. Textiles was reserved for MSNEs, small scale. Denotification of that, coming up with new labor laws, all that has happened. But those laws have not been notified. Will they get notified now? I have a mind out. They probably get notified after the May 24 elections. So let's hope your concerns get addressed by now. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi, sir. My name is Shubham from KMS. My question is about the MSME sectors. After the COVID, we've seen that uh, MSME has been uh, taken a hit by the lockdowns and all. But uh, after this budget, I think so focus has been more on MSMEs. So, regarding the India's economy, we kept a target of uh, reaching part vision by 2027. Uh, how, how do you see that uh, it progressing and contributing into the, into the uh, uh, economy regarding the MSME? Okay. See, MSMEs were protected actually. So MSMEs took a hit that's, that's normal. I mean, what happens in any economy when there is a slowdown, the ones who are at the bottom of the pyramid are the ones who will always get crushed. They are the ones who operate on wafer thin margins. So when you have the input prices go up, when you had, have a situation where the offtake doesn't take place, there are supply bottlenecks. See, who are these people? These are, these are small entrepreneurs who have set up shop and are working in conjunction with some of the medium or large companies, right? Just take a look at some of the news articles of post-budget. The finance minister has specifically in one of the uh, meetings with an industry body has said, has, in, has told the large uh, scale companies, the large, large sector, please pay MSMEs on time. Please, if there are any pending payments, please clear them right away. Now, that, uh, as, a, as a proof of uh, 
how MSMEs were protected. Now we, we saw that you know uh, there was a moratorium on the loan payment, so they were ring fenced uh, for almost like 18 months. So they survived. But take a look at the one one metric, bank credit growth. You know what is driving bank bank credit growth right now? Consumers and MSMEs. 16% or 18% of the incremental bank credit growth is going to MSMEs. Why are they borrowing? They're borrowing because there is growth. PLI has ensured that you know there is an integration between the large uh, uh, companies and, uh, this, and, and the small sector companies. The integration part of it, as, as it how it accelerates, you will find them come out. Minus MSMEs, you will not be able to grow. More important, as I said, take a look at the bank credit growth. The bank credit growth is clearly showing you MSMEs have bounced back. Incremental credit offtake is from MSMEs. setting up new manufacturing units, <coughs> otherwise it is 25%. Yeah. With by and large it is 25%. The, uh, foreign investment that you need to come inside because at the end of the day you are trying to capture the China plus one opportunity, EU plus one opportunity, whatever plus one opportunity that is there. For that you need to set up fresh units. That is, those are the only ones who get 15%. 
take a look at how many people in this country, I mean, don't take a look at how many people file returns. Take a look at how many people pay taxes and what is the personal tax collection. It, you'll be shocked that there are probably 30 lakh people in this country who declare that their income is 10 lakhs and above. 30 lakhs. Mumbai has two crore population. I not have everything for free. At the end of the day, you need money, right? Somebody just mentioned there you was know, something else that was needed for you. Now you want GST also. So you want to buy an EV. So that I, if, you, if you see in my presentation, I spoke about it, that the convoluted tax structure, inverted tax, tax structure that was there, they have tried to address it. So not just for uh, domestic consumption, but for even for exports. There were those input items where that were imported. They had a higher tax, which made exports unviable. So those things are getting addressed. At the end of the day, my suggestion, and that's why I said, the government does not have a magic wand, nor are they God. <coughs> you have to keep on making interventions and you have to keep on making representations. That's why I say, create a budget analysis club. Let KBS take the lead. I don't know how many business schools are doing it. Get together. Start discussing. Sit in probably in, in such a nice auditorium, watch the budget together, select one channel, listen to all the people who come over there. I enjoy even today because I learn. I sit and listen to I mean, I, I, Of course, I can't leave the, the channel and go, but so many people come and give you different perspectives. At the end of the day, you have the ability to call. I mean, Madam uh, has access to all the top shot uh, CEOs, CFOs, CEOs of this. Uh, uh, country of the, of the large corporates and discuss with them. Find out what do you feel. Analyze, sit with the faculty, make intervention. Take this part seriously. It will help you, not, not me. It will not help the government. Doesn't matter whether they read, they don't read. It will help you. It will help you emerge as a leader. I One of the reasons I left my job and I, and I created Equipoise is because I wanted to interact with you all. At the end of the day, what you do tomorrow will determine where the country goes. You are the future. You, you, you write it. You send it. Don't wait whether they are going to read or not. Now coming back to your third question. Gig economy. Right? Gig it is called. No? Or gig. Gig. G-I-G? Okay. Thank you. What the government wants, what jobs it wants are over here. PLI sector. China plus one. EU plus one. That is what they are investing in. Beyond that, they have created something called a Startup India. There is ample opportunity for you to create on your own and attract foreign investment. What, what is it? Something like 100, 109 now unicorns in India? Right? So, beyond this, where you want to go is up to you. Where does the government see? They have shown their intention. They are promoting. They have created 14 uh, you know, uh, sectors wherein they are promoting PLI and they are moving in, the, in that direction. Some of the things that they are also taking interest in and they have, they have moved really fast is the defense sector. Now you have a list of what, 200 plus, 250 plus items with a 2025 deadline to ensure that all these items are manufactured in India 100%. Just see what is happening to some of the companies in the uh, defense sector. All of them were probably like languishing in uh, just four, three, four years back. Today, take a look at the uh, you know uh, revenue growth, the profit of these companies. I should have given this disclaimer. I spoke about this company called uh, Indian Hotels. I don't hotels. I don't own Indian Hotel. Nor have I advised any of my clients about Indian Hotels. Uh, Defense sector, yes, I do have a personal interest and I have advised my uh, investors' clients also. My question is, uh, how effective are the schemes announced for rural economy in the union budget? So if you see, the uh, rural expenditure has actually gone down. Uh, people have been complaining about, uh, you know, Mandrega. The outlay for Mandrega has gone down. But Mandrega is a demand-oriented scheme. If there is demand, nothing stops you from you know coming up with revised estimates and making the allocation. The focus right now, I mean, bulk of the 
you know, uh, initiatives, for example, PM Gram Sadak Yojana or Mandrega, a lot has been done over there already. We've seen in, in the first five years, or you had, uh, you know, Ujwala gas, you had uh, Bijli bulb in, in the house, you had, uh, you know, roads that were getting built, Avas, toilets. So it's not that uh, the absolute number, the intention has, has gone away. The intention is there, but it is more demand oriented now than, uh, you know, a, a push from the government. The focus now has shifted over to, to everybody said this, right, that the, that the facilities or the infrastructure on the urban uh, side is woefully inadequate. So if you look at Mumbai, Mumbai I think has been ignored completely. You look at any of the cities in Maharashtra, look completely ignored, right? So that part is getting plugged so that uh, you have enough growth that comes out of, you know, de anything on these uh, places. You have to. Yes. So, uh, you spoke about, uh, you know, the uh, growth that India is polished for. And you spoke, you touched upon the fact that uh, US will need uh, more people for jobs. Okay? True. So, we've crossed a very important 75 year mark. I want to know your projection about where India will be, where you feel India will be in 2047, given these dynamics now. It's very simple actually to do because at the end of the day, just figure out what is the growth projections that are, that are there. So if you if you look at this number over here, and I have no reason not to believe this number. Yes, this one over here. If you look at the projections, because at no point in the how, how how much am I going to deviate from this number? I mean, somebody says it's going to be 8% real growth over 22 to 25. If you do an average up to the Amrit Kal, it comes to around 5%. The government or, or, or the or RBI's own estimate or you know, comfort zone for inflation is 4 to 6% back. 4% is very uh, plus minus 2. So assume the, the inflation is at 4%. Inflation is, is I mean, you, 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 I, I don't expect it to be low in, in a... a growing country and aspirational country like India. So 4% and average is 5%. You will get a nominal growth of 9%, right? Up compound kar lo. At 3.45 into 1.9 raised to 25, you will get a number of 26 to 8. That's how I am doing it. Because how, how do I figure out, you know, uh, whether EY or any of the uh, Wall Street majors or even RBI's own projections, uh, whether they are right or wrong, I'm not getting into that zone. But for sure, I, I know one thing, that in a country like India with 140 crore population, getting a 5 to 6 percent real growth is not difficult. And uh, just take a look at things around, uh, have we crossed uh, all the thresholds? I mean, are we a mature economy? Are we a, an economy where uh, penetration levels have crossed? Just take a look at housing, take a look at white goods. Or take a look at mutual funds. In, when, I'm, when I say mutual funds, I'm specifically uh, talking about uh, financial savings. The, the penetration levels are anemic. We get 8%, 9%, 4%, these kind of numbers. Take a look at mortgage as a percentage of GDP. Those numbers are also anemic. Compare those numbers with uh, you know the global averages. Take a look at insurance penetration and compare that with the global averages. Take a look at uh, you know, a simple thing like uh, tax as a, as, uh, as a percentage of GDP and compare that with the OECD average. We are rejoicing today that we have uh, on an on a expanded base 11% as tax to GDP ratio, which is good. I mean, it used to be much lower than that. If you go back 10, 20 years, it used to be 7%, 8%. We've crossed. But compare that with OECD averages. Compare that with some of the WB. So we are talking of India becoming a developed economy, right? So you will cross at 20% because OECD average is 34. By and large, most of the uh, you know consumer durables, uh, cars, whichever product that you look at, the penetration levels are in double digits. So that part of consumption is yet to happen. People are still going to buy. Plus, here is a country of youth sitting right behind you. There is yet to start consumption. Whatever consumption they have done so far is a cost on the parents. 
they will start earning and they will start consuming. That is yet to happen and we are still uh, growing at the rate of at least say 2%, right? Achieving 6%, I think it's doable. <laughs> mentioned about the trade is there. So, uh, along with that, we have seen the pattern every year about the low river scheme. By the low river scheme, by the government, mainly for the farmers or something like it, like a country market, so which has a negative impact on the, on the uh, economy somewhere. So, what might be the alternative ways to tackle such conditions or situation for that? I haven't because heard a, a single loan waiver scheme in the last four or five years. Uh, it happens around like, uh, the new government, there is a combination of new government. No, see, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, no, no, I, you, are, you are right, probably, you know, uh, history textbooks would have, because, uh, would have told you this, you know, about freebies and loan melas and all that, you know, there used to be, I don't want to take names over here, but there used to be some politicians uh, from the northern side of the, where people used to talk of, you know, loan waivers. This government has been talking about, and rightfully so, I mean, somebody who has been in power for eight years cannot talk about what I will do. He will have to talk about what I have done. So this government talks of performance. I have seen that right from day one. Minimum government, maximum governance. Uh, government has no business to be in business, no remedies. I haven't seen any remedies given. I cannot call COVID-related measures as remedies at all. Those were humanitarian efforts made and rightfully so. So this government has not done it. Who is announcing them? Those who want to get into power are doing it. Plus there are certain state governments who have moved to old pension scheme. Well, people in this country are not fools. They are seeing what is happening in Pakistan. There was a time, probably in the 70s, when the economy of Pakistan was greater than the economy of India. They were growing at a even faster rate. People, uh, there were experts, there were um, uh, you know, rating companies, agencies which used to say that you know they are going to be a miracle economy. Remedies have brought them where they are. They are, I think, uh, three days of uh, worth of foreign exchange with them right now. Right? We, we see around us, just one more number I'll give you, Bangladesh. Bangladesh's per capita GDP had touched India's per capita GDP just a year or two back and they were considered as a miracle economy you know, uh, textile export hub, so on and so forth, and people were singing. They are also standing in queue with in, in front of IMF. And who is guaranteeing that? I, India is telling IMF, don't worry. Usne paisa nahi diya. Paisa nahi hoega, main dunga, main huna. Correct? Same is the case with Sri Lanka. Pakistan was denied. Bangladesh got. Sri Lanka also got. Everywhere, India aspect is there. What caused this? Freebies. People in this country vote differently, have matured. Indian electorate, Indian voter has matured, in my opinion, over the last 10 years. He votes differently at the center and state and municipal election, in my opinion. So I haven't really seen, you know, these kind of loan melas as they were called during my college days. So, like, sir, like, is about Delhi government, which gets about so there is a kind of things happening, state-wise, uh, government. Okay. See, cannot extrapolate one city which calls itself a state and then compare that with a country. <laughs> right? There will always be these outliers. There will always be these people who will want freebies. Read <coughs> India's history. India was never won by the invaders. India was lost by insiders. Revedies were the reason. People are getting awakened. People are reading. You guys are lucky. You have YouTube. You have so many, and there are a lot of people who come and explain. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't push. I wouldn't push. Uh, uh, you know this uh, logic of Delhi across. Yes, there is one more state where it has gone. But as I say, you know, people vote differently. So last question from my side. Uh, since I've studied about the power sector, so power sector is focusing on green energy and like 3 lakh uh, crore has been invested this time by the government to meet the net zero goals. 
But the fact is that green energy is not sufficient to meet the daily requirements of the population of India we have. So how can India manage its the energy requirement with the sustainable energies and not returning the investment in the time sustainable energies are not returning the investments? How can we can manage a net zero as well as uh, the fiscal deficit which we are facing? Because power is a very huge sector and a very large investment has been done in the sector. And that's uh, Good question. So I'll tell you what. Uh, if you look at the projections that, that are there available in terms of, so it's nice, we talk about green energy, we talk of renewables, wind, so on and so forth. But even then, even after say 10 years, we will still have a significant portion coming out of coal. It will go down, but it will still be there. I My interactions with the experts in the power sector, and uh, I do what I do for a living is invest people's money, right? So I speak with them. But I understand nuclear it towards embracing and putting large capacities on the nuclear power side. Uh, when does that happen? What causes it? I have no idea. But uh, you will have decent amount of investments in this country from my interactions with these experts and people who have spent you know, decades in this uh, uh, sector that the only way forward to meet, I mean, you have to be electric vehicles, electric scooters, everything is, is on charge right now. Huge surge. I mean, we are going to see nearly three to four times surge in, uh, you know, in, the, in the power consumption. I'll just show you one chart which I have. consumption is nearly going up by 50%. It's not going to materialize. So just see where we are. So fossil generation is still a significant portion of it, right? Nuclear will be the answer. It's just a matter of time when that is embraced. Fiscal, you know, fiscal deficit to come down from 6.4 to 5.9 is the growth, is the tax collection, is that getting hampered by any reason? Are there any uh, freebies or some loan waivers or some melas or thelas that are happening? No. Government is focused. I mean, somebody who has been in power for 8-9 years cannot start talking to people about what I am going to do. We have to talk about what I have done. And what have they done? They have brought down the fiscal deficit, they have brought down the expenditure, they have increased the quality of the expenditure, they have gone through the capex route of, of building the economy, they have shown that tax collection has gone through the roof. You are seeing 150,000 crores being collected in, in GST, you are seeing gross tax, direct tax collection also go up significantly. Why would they not go up? Because Somebody who is confident, if you are confident of you know winning the election and coming back, you will do remedies. So, good question. In my opinion, uh, I look at the tax collection numbers, I look at the growth estimates, which are conservative. I think 5.9, in my opinion, is I won't be surprised if they you know beat it on the on the on the lower side as well. I won't be surprised if it is 5.6, 5.7, or even lower. Textile sector. So basically, textile sector raw material comes from 
uh, agriculture sector. So agro textile crop farming is also like farming which contributes to textile sector for uh, making a yarn and cultivating you know, finished goods of like clothes and curtains. So sir, as the India's population is very high and there is also India's need consumption for uh, food and also like wearing of clothes. So it is very difficult to like do the farming of equal like agro textile crop farming and also like food crop cultivating farming. So sir, is like lack availability of the land in India is stopping this textile sector to contribute more than GDP. Like as I have studied that China is number one in technology, so they have used technologies like to convert from raw yarn into a complete finished clothes or any of the product, textile products. So is India is facing any problem in lack availability of land from textile sector? See, I already answered this. The basic problem why textiles has not taken off is because of labor laws. This is a sector which was reserved for MSMEs and small scale units. Labor laws, as I mentioned, were written in this country with a, with a complete socialist bent in 1890s and 1940s. We haven't seen changes to that. Whatever changes have been done now which are pro-industry have yet to be notified. Once they get notified, I think you will have these uh, you know, issues addressed. But it's got nothing to do with land availability or crop cultivation. You just need to put scale. India missed that opportunity for which it fought and the opportunity was lapped up by actually China. And China set up huge uh, you know, uh, manufacturing units. Something that... Uh, uh, so. Let me take you back to the era where Europe had set quotas for you know uh, textile uh, exports and textile manufacturing. India fought for removal of those quotas and said that you know with these quotas, industrialization in developing economies, countries like India is getting hampered. Ultimately, they were removed, but India was not ready to capture it. Who captured it? So India fought the battle, got those quotas removed. China took it away because we didn't have proper labor laws. That needs to be addressed. See, there are challenges, and uh, over a period of time, I, I think let's. I'm hopeful that you know, come uh, June 2024 onwards, maybe these issues will get addressed, and uh, textiles and uh, all those sectors which are heavily uh, job oriented, those issues get addressed. Thank you. So on behalf of Koinur Education Trust, School of Management, KBS and KMS, I take this opportunity to thank Mr. Ashish Vakankar sir for the detailed in-depth analysis done for the budget with a lot of simplicity and thank you so much sir for your patience of take, taking all the questions with you know and detailing giving the answers to all those questions so thank you very much for this. It was indeed a very nice session. I would like to thank Karve sir who has always ensured we give the best to our students and his eye for detailing is truly appreciating and we are all very proud to be working under his guidance. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shetlana, ma'am, Director KBS. Also, Dr. Sandeep Savan, uh, Director PGDM for conducting this event. All my faculties, staff and all the organizers here, thank you very much. And special thanks to the students for ensuring the story started for just in a lecture where they said we really need to understand the budget. And with every, the students got themselves convert, you know, formed in the groups, each one doing a sectoral analysis, the faculty is guiding them for their analysis and an expert coming and giving a holistic approach of budget. So thank you very much, sir. Once again, thank you all to be a part of this event. Thank you, sir.
हेलो आई हैव द प्लेजर ऑफ गोइंग थ्रू द डिटेल रिपोर्ट व्हिच मिस्टर वाकनकर हैज मेड ऑन उत्तर प्रदेश यू नो इट्स अ वेरी इलेबोरेट रिपोर्ट इट आई हैड बॉट इट फॉर माय पर्सनल कंजम्पशन एंड अंडरस्टैंडिंग आई वुड लाइक टू लीव इट इन द लाइब्रेरी नाउ फॉर एनी वन ऑफ यू हु इज इंटरेस्टेड इन look you going through the report and learning more about because this was a very brief uh, thing that he has gone through once you go through the report you will understand that was on one state but the state which is emerging very fast so you know that uh, you have to understand how the india story is going to be so i will leave that in the library for all of you thank you